solutions in their implementation. Thank you, University. It's fantastic. A lovely range of different types of interest. Okay, thank you. I'll go back to it just means architecture and lots from vertical green. So we've got quite a few from university, but also good industry involvement, which is always um, important on these calls and some local authorities and municipalities. That's excellent. So these are key target audiences. Brilliant. Wow. Great. So when we're talking about nature based solutions, we work with the European definition and you can see it here on the screen. So the important thing is it's um, the solutions will provide co benefits to people to nature and to people at the same time. Roisin, could I yeah. just would you like me to stop sharing Manti now and you go back to your presentation? Oh, sorry, I thought you could see my screen. Yes, please. Yeah. Tell me when you can see. Yep, we can see it now. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. So here we are, the European Commission definition of nature based solutions. And as I said, it's important. It's, um, co, you know, it has co benefits to people and to nature. And there's multi solutions. So when I'm talking to people about what nature based solutions are, um, I often refer to Dr. Stuart Combs um, principles of nature based solutions. So we can talk about them by asking questions about nature based solutions such such as are we using nature or natural processes? Does our solution provide or improve social benefits, economic benefits, environmental benefits? Does it have a net benefit to biodiversity? And I think these illustrate that nature based solutions are something of a deep process approach to planning and design of our city place. This thinking of our areas of intervention as part of an interconnected and interdependent complex natural systems. And also then looking in detail of our elements of design that we're going to use to, to solve the problems. For example, can we get organic plants? Are our paths porous? How are we thinking about using water? Can we do short circuit economy? And there's a multitude of questions we can ask in our panel today will illustrate more examples. So we want to run, please, one more Menti poll where we ask, if I can stop sharing this for a minute. Um, uh, we'd just like to ask you what in your practice or study, if you're from academia, um, how do you waste different principles of um, nature-based solutions? I just find this principle of net gain to nature very important. And we know that uh, monitoring of na nature-based solutions is also an emerging field. And I think the ele element of time is very important when we're monitoring, because as landscape architects and urban planners would know, there's all, often a little period of destruction to nature before we're building back um, ecosystems that can bring wider benefits. So I think our intention can be like the Green Deal, where we say we're giving back more to nature than we take. This might take a certain time. So will we go on to? Let's have, I'm not seeing, sometimes the results take it. There we go. Oh, here we go. Wow. <laughs> to come through, Roaching. Yeah. That. So that's really interesting. I'm glad we waited because, yeah. I mean, you can see there, and I always think this is really interesting because when people think about nature based solutions, they always associate it with the benefits for the environment. But um, what we often see in particular in urban projects is that the social benefits um, are often equally important. Um, yeah, and I, I like what's coming up about the co design with people because cities find that, um, in my experience, it's a big investment and um, uh, are too panels today are going to discuss their 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 work co-designing it's a big investment but it's really really worth it for the long-term viability of projects so i'm happy to see that up so high that's great thank you so much everybody
Do you want to share your presentation again, uh, Roshin? Um, well, actually, but, uh, we could move on now. We, I was going to introduce um, Limerick and hear how how they're getting on. So um, if we could have Rosie's presentation. Thanks, Roshin. Let me see if I can, if I can share that. Um, and you can tell me now if you can see that. Yeah. And what I might do is is put that into, uh, let me see. I'll actually just start the slideshow. So how's that? Can you guys all see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So thanks very much for in inviting us today from Limerick. My name is Rosie Webb and I'm the senior architect in Limerick City and County Council. I actually work in the economic development section and I'm also the Lighthouse City lead for our Horizon 2020 project that we have that I'll describe to you. But I suppose, um, as it says in the program, um, Limerick is really, I suppose, at the early stages of implementing uh, nature by design uh, projects. And in fact, we have, I suppose, always had those policies in our development plans in uh, specific policies around um, things like sustainable uh, urban drainage and green infrastructure, but we're only now embarking upon setting out a, a policy for the council on green blue infrastructure. Um, and what we're presenting today really with myself and my colleague Sarah O'Malley is, uh, I suppose our observations that some of the greatest successes that we've had in starting to work this way have been through the uh, uh, EU um, grant aided projects that we're doing both in Horizon 2020 and in Herb Act. Uh, and particularly because I think they allow us to work both across departments and also across agencies. So obviously working with universities and with uh, innovators in their field. So I'm just gonna, we only really have about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to introduce the Horizon 2020 project that we have. And then I'm gonna leave uh, some time for Sarah O'Malley to introduce the Urbeck project that we're doing. So the Horizon 2020 project is a project called Positive City Exchange. And it's really around building uh, a positive uh, energy uh, district in our city center. And just maybe to step back for a minute and to introduce Limerick, uh, we are one of two lighthouse cities in the bid, the others in Trondheim and Norway. And what we have in common with uh, Trondheim and Norway is that we are both cities on the west coast of our country. So Ireland is in the extreme west of uh, the island and we're the third largest city. So we're a population of about 100,000 people. And really this project has been very instrumental in helping us uh, set out a kind of climate action plan, which we're at the beginning of, and also beginning to, to um, d identify some decarbonization zones for uh, demonstration areas, which we've been asked to do uh, through our central government. So the project involves the two lighthouse cities, but also a number of follower cities. And it really, uh, focuses on the creation of a positive energy block in our historic city center. And there's sort of three uh, themes to that. Firstly is prototyping the future using uh, 3D modeling and simulation and also integrated planning processes. So part of what we're doing is setting out a bold city vision for the future of the city and that's being integrated into our development plan. And what's been very interesting is that we've done similar exercises at the start of our last development plan People were very interested in, in economy, but now what we find is they're much more interested in nature, they're much more interested in climate change. Um, the second strand of that is this enabling of the future. So all of the en uh, engineering infrastructure that allows us to create a community grid and these kind of exchange uh, of energy between buildings and between buildings and vehicles. And then also the kind of uh, the, the peer to peer trading market that allows people to do that kind of trading. And then thirdly, and I think people, something that people might hear might be very interested in it, is this idea of accelerating the future through co-design. So we've set up a whole, um, uh, let's say innovation lab and innovation playground that is a kind of a host place for uh, living labs that allows us to, to kind of co-design solutions together with our citizens. Um, so really the strategy for the project is to begin at a kind of a block level, which is five buildings to get them exchanging energy um, and then moving into a kind of a district level and then hopefully on, onto the city and to expand from there. 
Um, as I mentioned, the, the kind of demonstration area for this for the project involves our, our his, the city center core and in particular our, our historic Georgian neighborhood. It also includes uh, the river associated and adjacent to that area. Part of the project is uh, trying to implement uh, uh, river turbines. Um, really what's been quite difficult is finding uh, places for renewable energy within the compact urban district. So that's, uh, that's actually our demonstration area. And then we have a number of demonstration projects that enable us to do that. Everything from creating the Bold City Vision as a co-creation exercise with our citizens, setting up these engagement uh, platforms, the, let's say the playground area in which we can test out the solutions that people come forward with, both in terms of working with local uh, innovators, local businesses, but also citizen solutions, things that people themselves come up with. Um, there's a whole, uh, in these darker blue areas are all the demonstration projects that have to do with the setting up of the microgrid, um, the electromobility solutions, the creation of that distributed positive energy block and the regulatory mechanisms that have to be enabled to allow that to happen. And then these kind of trading platforms and flexibility markets. And then um, I suppose the, the final project is this creation of a, of a digital twin, a kind of digital modeling uh, platform that allows us to kind of scenario test both on the urban scale and then right down to the building scale. So for people themselves. And really we're involved in the project for a number of reasons. I suppose our, we have a huge interest in looking at clean energy sources and then how we capture for Limerick um, the climate energy jobs that are associated with that. Um, we have a lot of uh, vacancy and underuse in our historic city center. So looking at a high level of how we, we increase the use of, this, of our city center, uh, testing out some of the e-mobility solutions and then finally, uh, looking at the smart uh, community cooperation models. So that, that describes our large EU uh, Horizon 2020 project. And I might just hand over to Sarah uh, O'Malley, my colleague, who will tell you a little bit more about our Urbact project. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. If it's OK, Siobhan, I'll share the presentation from here. Perfect. Yeah. So hopefully you all can see that. Just yeah. go down here. Yeah. Um, and apologies, my camera is not working, but I am here and I do exist. So I thought, thank you, Rosie, for your presentation there. And thank you and hope all of you are keeping safe and well. For the five minutes or so that I have, I thought I would focus on two projects. I'm going to give you just a short, very brief overview of the larger project, which is called Go Green Roots. And I'll give more detail on where we are with Urbact uh, Health and Green Spaces. So for Go Green Roots, it's another Horizon 2020 project. It's a quite a large one. There's 40 partners, uh, 17 PhD candidates, five postdocs, two interns, and a budget of just over 10 million. And it's over a four year period. And what Go Green Roots is looking at is implementing nature-based solutions. So linking of green corridors. And within Limerick, we're looking in particular at two target areas. One is a greenway. So there's a linear, uh, there's the potential for a linear park or um, a, a, a public park that we're looking to co-create with the community around that. And also a, a laneways project. So there's 25 laneways within Limerick. Um, and we're looking to see what opportunities we can um, enhance those spaces through Go Green Routes and linking these spaces, whether it's through animation or a walkway uh, within the city. So that's a four year project that just started uh, last year. And the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more, this is a shorter term project. It started last year also, but it finishes in August 22 and it's called Urbact Health and Green Space. There's nine partners involved in this. And unlike Go Green Roots, where you will visually see changes at the end of the project, what Urbact is about is a policy tool. It's co-creating with communities a plan for their green space. And that can be leverage for funding. It can be a way of deciding what they would like in their green space by having these ongoing meetings with residents and an Urbact local group, which is integral to the process really. So we have like a tiered um, format, which is very helpful. So for example, we have six uh, parks that we're looking at in Limerick um, at the moment. 
and what's helpful is that they're all very complex, complex. Some could be slightly private, others could have social disadvantage, they could have rubbish, they could have um, uh, spaces that haven't been used in a while, they may not be as opened up and there might be, need some clearing to happen in these spaces. So conversations are very diverse. And within the Urbac local group, we can come back after site visits to this group of people of which include members within the council for planning and parks. You could have a member of the police service, uh, academics, people working in youth service, um, in local interest groups, tidy towns, environmental groups, a real broad spectrum across Limerick to avail of their knowledge and expertise on how to make the best of the opportunities, but also how to overcome some challenges. And I thought just on within, the, uh, sorry, to go back to the objective is to support and enhance the provision of quality green infrastructure in urban areas. And within Limerick, we're focused primarily on thematic areas three and four. So general impacts on physical and mental health and lifestyles and social function and physical activities. Now we have touched on uh, theme two, we have the Hush City app, which we use and we do monitor noise um, uh, within the city but heat stress, uh, our climate, you know, we have a, a few, a short number of very hot days in the year. So we really focused on the theme three and four here. And I suppose just the practical side as we're doing these site visits and what people are saying, I thought it might be interesting to just hear how one simple conversation can snowball. So we would find a point of contact for each green area and we go and meet them. And through that conversation, whether it's in a local community center, they might say, why don't you go and talk to so-and-so? So that involved meeting with local primary schools and how do they use this green area, which is called Bagot Estate. It's about 11 hectares, just, just a little bit out of the city center. Um, and when we met with the local schools, we found that one school in particular since COVID, since last September when the schools reopened for briefly, uh, they used it for fire school. So that opened a conversation in terms of, well, let's take a look at that. We're also talking with residents and other people in the area. Um, what would help to enhance that experience of fire school for that school or other schools beyond COVID? So the schools would go down beforehand and they would clear the area maybe of any rubbish and just check out boundaries. Um, but generally speaking, they use the same space every week for three hours with two to three primary school classes. So the ages there would be maybe from uh, eight to 12 years of age. And it really worked for them. They, it worked in terms of COVID and ventilation of the building and making sure that people were outdoors. But the linking with the curriculum was easy for them to do as well and to enhance their learning overall. Um, it also, it's a, in terms of ideas of what we could do for it, maybe a mound for people to climb up on, uh, some stumps maybe to sit on. And then you just engage in these conversations. Okay, well, what does that look like long-term for other residents in the area? Um, it just, in terms of the snowball, there can be very interesting conversations. And we are at this early stage across the few sites that I thought it might be something interesting. If you're working with youth groups and also residents groups that the local schools can also offer some really good ideas for you. And I think I would just going to say thank you for your time <laughs> and to, to leave it there. And Siobhan, if you have any questions, please do contact through the chat, obviously, for myself and Rosie. And Siobhan, I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Roisin, would you like to introduce the next speaker? Um, I'm, I'm just again to repeat, if, if I see some questions starting to come through now, and um, thank you for those. Um, I'll have a look at those and I'll bring them together and I'll put them to the panel at the end. Um, yeah. Um, Siobhan, we'd like to um, break up the two presentations with our video from, from Anna, our landscape architect in Pozan. Excellent. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Thank you. This is a lovely video of her, Anna's process. Hi, my name is Anna Komorowska. I am a landscape architect publisher and podcaster. And I had the pleasure of designing 20 natural playgrounds in kindergartens and free school grounds. And I like to tell you about these projects from my perspective. I chose five topics that I think they are important in the context of this project. First, sense. I really believe this project is meaningful. <laughs> I have two types of clients public administration and private uh, kindergartens. 
For first, I designed public playgrounds. Big projects, a lot of time and big budget. My three most important projects that you are watching right now are playgrounds in Krakow and Warsaw. They are always full of people, but they are no children who use this space every day. These children are there because the parents decided today we're going to do something special. Today we will go to these playgrounds. Natural playgrounds shouldn't be for special occasions. They should be an everyday landscape. On the other hand, I designed for private kindergartens. They are unique, alternatives, Montessori, Friba, and so on. Children use the garden every day, but these children are there because their parents decided you go to these special kindergartens. Natural playgrounds should be an everyday landscape for every child. It's something like my my private and also my office uh, mission. Second, energy. Uh, as part of my cooperation with uh, the Poznan City Hall, I was working on three, five, or even 12 gardens at the same time. Designing several places is challenging, but in some way it's easier and cheaper. <laughs> I can repeat some elements which uh, speeds up the project and it's easier for construction. However, it is not about my convenience, uh, but that I can use my energy better. When I work on a large public playgrounds uh, project, I work on one topic for many long months. <laughs> it's boring. When I work on the small kindergartens, uh, I am in the mode, in this mode, something new, finish, something new, finish, something new, finish. It's exhausting. In this case, both were avoided. It's something between. <laughs> the next point is design. Sometimes I had bad days, like everyone. <laughs> I look at my project and I thought I should do it better. I should add something else here. I should make it more beautiful. You know, I know contemporary landscape architecture. I search websites, I travel around Europe. <laughs> Not now, usually. <laughs> I admire the beautifully designed playgrounds. But, but when I look at them for a longer time, I think they were made to have a wow effect instead of really serving the children. I know that with the condition we had and with the budget we had, we did a lot. I know that more important than wow effect than design <laughs> is that our gardens serve children and teachers that they allow close contact with nature and that they can change when it is needed. It's also very, very important. The last two points are about people. First, it was a process. Workshops for principals, workshops for teachers, meetings in the garden, and later also cooperation with uh, constructors. I have designed almost a hundred playgrounds and kindergartens gardens. And I know that size doesn't matter, location doesn't matter, not even the profile of the institution. People are the most important. If we design a natural playground, which teacher uh, don't understand, where they don't want to go, it doesn't make sense. That's why don't stop at the design itself. Teachers should feel like co-authors of this project. And finally, more from the perspective of a business owner than a landscape architect, a coordinator. The strength of this project was the coordinator, a person who took over a whole lot of ungrateful tasks, uh, who looked after deadlines, people and papers, who helped facilitate the whole process. And I know that it's almost impossible for you to find a person like we are lucky to have in Poznań. The best advice should be clon Kasia Bogdańska, <laughs> but try to find someone who can grasp it all and will do it with a smile. That's it. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I am here for you. 
and feel free to contact me later if you want. You, Thank you very much. And now if we could ask Anishka to share her screen yes. and her process. Okay, hello, good afternoon to everybody. It's great to be here with you and share our uh, experience. And uh, today, uh, me and Agnieszka Dziupała represent uh, Poznan City Hall and Project Connecting Nature, but I also had a head of uh, Health and Green Space Project, similar to, to Sarah. We are uh, also implemented in, uh, in Poznan. And firstly, I would like to start with uh, some motto. Children love nature and need to contact with it. The garden can be a place full of adventures and ideas for crazy fun. By acting and experimenting, children develop all their senses. And that's the reason why we implement um, natural playgrounds in Poznań. And maybe some uh, short information for those who maybe don't know where the Poznań is. It's a city in the uh, West Central Poland, in the greater Poland region. And for those who used to use a lot of cars internationally, it's halfway between uh, Berlin and uh, Polish municipal, uh, Polish capital city, Warsaw. So uh, we started natural playgrounds uh, already a um, long time ago. But when we were in the initiating stage, we didn't know that the process will take so much time and that we will find the place we are now. Because firstly, we were implementing project uh, Yale between Poznan and Berlin kindergartens. And we exchanged uh, uh, some learning methods about active methods of learning in preschools. And then we discovered how important for the uh, development of children is not only indoor uh, designing uh, what is indoor, but also what is outside. And in 2017, we started workshops with preschools, with uh, experts who, like uh, Anna Komorowska, landscape architect, with ecologists, with contractors, with civil servants, with all the enthusiasts of the project. And uh, next year's we implemented um, and we uh, finally had uh, three uh, pilot projects, three kindergarten active uh, in this process. And that was a big success. When we um, started uh, to be a partner in Connecting Nature project in 2017, uh, we thought that maybe that will be a great occasion to upscale our experience with this type of nature-based solution, natural playground, and we did it. So in 2020, we have already a network of 20 natural playgrounds. And I would like to tell you something about uh, challenges uh, we had um, when you start creating natural playgrounds and still some of them uh, exist. They are economical one, financial capabilities uh, to find resources for natural playground. That's not a piece of cake. And uh, very often you have to use the cross uh, financial uh, sources. Uh, between uh, you have to, the, the kindergartens have to choose between infrastructure and luxury needs. Uh, because the basic infrastructure, that's not the same what is natural playgrounds and playgrounds was treated at the beginning as something luxury. When you are introducing natural playgrounds, uh, there is also a lot of time and effort you have to put to it. Uh, for example, teachers are, um, uh, and, um, teachers are involved uh, in uh, co-production process. And the effort you have to make when children have to use another space when your construction starts, it's also a kind of uh, challenges you have to face up. Educational ones. Status of outdoor space was much more lower than uh, inside activities. So we also have to change a little bit awareness. And the same was with the outdoor activities. When I was a child, it was uh, normal to spend a lot of time uh, outdoor. Uh, but recently, most of the children spent their 
time uh, differently. And sometimes the kindergarten also didn't spend uh, too much time outside if they as they could. But it also the status has changed recently. Social challenge. Access to preschool facilities has on, have only children that attend the uh, preschool. So maybe we should find another way. And that's what we did with the open garden. I will tell a little bit later also something more. Health oriented challenges, um, fear versus safety. Parents and teacher were really afraid of using natural uh, equipment because they got used to, to the typical plastic or metal one. But uh, we address this issue and we uh, ensure that also the natural equipment can have uh, needed certificates. And uh, last but not least in this um, group of challenges, COVID-19. It uh, influences all of us in different ways. Uh, from the beginning, there was a problem at all to use the garden, but uh, in, few, uh, in some weeks, it's turned out just that uh, there are some limitation how many children at the same time can use uh, the space. The more problem is rather with the social interactions between children because the group are smaller now, who are the group that are using the, um, the uh, natural playground. And the most uh, affected one is uh, open garden, unfortunately, because it uh, lost uh, its, uh, at this time of COVID, it lost its um, destination. It's not open for uh, all people in neighborhood. And uh, more from the perspective of uh, landscape uh, architecture or architects, uh, it's quite normal and obvious that in the preschool, uh, teachers and headmasters, they don't, uh, they don't have competences for special space, uh, special planning. So they have to find somebody who will help them in designing a really good space. So we also face up another problem, how to find a good uh, person or company that could link uh, so many competences designing project process, uh, co-creation elements, implementation of the natural playgrounds. That's, that's really not easy. And in Poznan, we even couldn't find expert on natural playgrounds uh, only for designing process. It was uh, some years ago when we had started. And then we found Anna Komorowska in Krakow. So we transfer her, her knowledge, her experience uh, to Poznan. And that was the beginning of uh, lasting so far, good, great cooperation. And we are very happy to have her on board. Just shortly, our potential for development. We still want to develop natural playgrounds in, play, in preschools. We think about next natural step uh, as uh, natural playgrounds in schools, although they've got quite other circumstances than preschools. We, are, we want to develop this open garden I mentioned. Open garden is the space that uh, kindergarten is sharing with the neighbors, with other parents, with children that don't, don't attend uh, the, the right one. Um, kindergarten. It's a, it's a really good solution for the cities. Unfortunately, in this COVID time, it has a lot of limitation. Winter garden, that's really also something very interesting, especially when you've got this disgusting winter and autumn uh, weather with only raining days. But uh, to be honest, what it's more important, the time when you've got the uh, low quality air and you are looking for solution for the children and even for adults to spend time in a good uh, surrounding with a lot of greenery. Then think about gardens inside of the buildings. And we uh, started cooperation with architects about that. And we have a great uh, plans. We have the great uh, project, but we are now looking money for developing this concept. And the future is, of course, the network of natural playgrounds in public space and private spaces. But then it's very important to think about who will be maintaining the, the space. 
And my last words about how to increase demand for natural playgrounds in the city. Uh, it's good to uh, find the right groups to uh, go as a target groups. And we organized a seminar for kindergartens and um, heads off. So there was uh, more than hundreds uh, directors of um, kindergartens in Poznan in one place and they uh, learn about it. We prepare a guidebook for them with practical information and some inspiration. We organized uh, meetings in uh, City Hall for um, stakeholders of Connecting Nature and stakeholders of Health and Green Space uh, project, uh, talking about different uh, nature-based solutions, including natural playground. And we had also dedicated workshop uh, for uh, health and green space stakeholder only on natural playgrounds. So uh, now I will ask Agnieszka to tell you more about uh, implementation uh, of our natural playgrounds. Okay, thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, now I would like to present some uh, results of delivering such solutions in Poznań preschool gardens. Please, Aga, change my slides, it will be fast. <laughs> Our <laughs> collaboration with the landscape architect uh, consisted of involving all users of playgrounds in the process of jointly designing uh, of the natural garden. Through numerous meetings and workshop with kindergarten management, with teachers, uh, to workshop with children who drew their dreams and presented in the form of colorful artistic uh, works, what they like doing in the garden. And this way ideas were collected, consulted, and on this basis, uh, the architect created a conceptual project for the development of natural playground, taking into uh, account the needs of play, uh, movement, uh, relaxation, and ecological education of children. As a result, uh, a new space is created called a nature-oriented playground. Uh, so different from the space we encounter every day that this common playground dominated by concrete and plastic toys uh, or equipment. Uh, together with the architect and teachers, we wanted to create a space uh, that would be child-friendly, positively influencing the development, creativity, desensitizing to the environment, as well as space that would um, bring multiple benefits to the natural environment. Uh, a nature-oriented playground uh, is a place where natural elements uh, are mainly used. Uh, the concrete surface, uh, surface is replaced with a natural surface made of earth, grass, and sand. Uh, earthen elements are used for play, like mounds, uh, natural paths. Uh, also using plant elements, vegetation to create a bush maze, living willow huts, uh, places where children can play freely using sand and water like, like mud kitchen. And additionally, we implement a project of ecological demonstrators, the aim of which is to promote the sensitivity to, to nature among preschoolers and knowledge about the natural processes that take place around us. Uh, also, teachers will receive uh, lesson scenarios that are tailored to eco-demonstrators so they can also use them to work with children um, during lessons on ecological and environmental topics. These are elements made of wooden and plant materials like living tables, which is table uh, planted with evergreen vegetation, also house of, for insects, vegetable beds, which are uh, elements illustrating the natural processes taking place in micro scale. Uh, Nature-oriented playgrounds uh, give children and teachers the opportunity to experience nature directly. Uh, and in the city scale, it creates an additional uh, green and natural space which brings a number of benefits. So first of all, it's a tailor-made space corresponding to, uh, to physical needs, play, relaxation, and environmental education among children. The space can be considered in the social context uh, in which the integration of children can occur. It affects the well-being, uh, physical and mental health of children through environmental education. We develop this pro-environmental behavior uh, among children, and it's a space where children can experience nature in their own way. This is also the natural space that's uh, starting to bring environmental benefits. We unseal concrete surfaces, create biologically active surfaces, facilitating the water retention, uh, introduce new plantings of vegetation, also those that favor pollinating uh, insects, plant fruit bushes, 
These are, uh, these are also activities related to mitigating climate change, so thanks to which we fit into the strategic objective of the city uh, of Poznan, so adaptation and mitigation to climate change. And the last thing, uh, the implementation of such projects affect the shaping of the market. We enter with new trends that were not so popular before in the city. We create a market for new services, for new contractors, which numbers are increasing every year. Uh, it's also a certain education of such contractors in the topics of nature-based solutions because we as, as the procurer or, or contracting authority are not, on, are not only about planting plants or implementing the wooden elements. Our point is that if teachers choose an insect uh, house in the garden, the contractor should know and understand that it is necessary to plant such species of plants around this insect house that will favor dispollinating insects and it's about creating a space that will be functional and favorable uh, to the environment uh, in many aspects. And that's, it's very encouraging. Uh, uh, and this is the fact that more and more contractors and gardeners take up these challenges and want to follow this trend. So uh, to sum up, uh, 20 natural playgrounds were created in the city uh, and 24 preschools were equipped only with the project of eco demonstrators. So in total, uh, 44 preschools in Poznań already have this natural and ecological spaces for children. So the future is unsure, but we hope that uh, together with landscape architects and uh, ur urban planners, we could deliver more and more nature-based solutions and uh, nature-oriented playgrounds in our city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful presentation from both Pozan and Limerick. Thank you so much. We'd like to open the floor to uh, questions that are coming in thick and fast. Um, Siobhan, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, yes. Thank you, Roisin. Um, actually, you, you've raised a really uh, another a couple of important points there, um, Agnieszka, um, which I think have been taken up in some of the questions in the chat. But if I could perhaps start with the title of this webinar, um, which was about translating visions of nature-based solutions into reality. And we've heard from two cities now in Poznan and Limerick about the challenges they face from a city perspective. But I'd like to ask the same question, if I could, of Roisin and Anna, who are landscape architects. So could I ask what were the challenges that you faced in dealing with cities in uh, translating these visions into reality. And I think, Anna, you're, I know you've answered this question perhaps already in chat, but um, if you would like to, uh, I know you're involved, so if you want to turn on your mic and, and share your views with us, that would be even better. I can see you somewhere there. While we're waiting for Anna, perhaps Roisin, if you want to, to go first. Yeah, sure. Uh, I suppose in Ireland, different cities have are different ways down the journey of implementing nature-based solutions in both um, in all aspects of the city. Um, I suppose we we also, um, as was touched upon there, it's a if you ask contractors to to bring in um, organic plants or small heritage trees or uh, can we get our stone locally? It's it it's met with some surprise. Um, so it's a transitioning process and it's a journey. And I think um, what Ignatia was pointing out that, um, you know, now there are more contractors who will do this. And that's wonderful for me to hear because, you know, as we start going down this road, we would like to see more and more contractors. But particularly in Ireland, we only have, I think, one um, nursery who supplies organic perennials. Um, so these kind of details are important. And that's what I would say. And of course, what do you think? That's, that's also, Roisin, one of the main reasons why we set up this community across Europe, because some countries are more advanced than others. And there are some people like Anna, who's a really a visionary in this field. Um, and how, how can we encourage other uh, landscape architects um, to follow, to learn, and to be part of this community? Um, which we've developed on the platform. Anna, what is your view on that? Uh, from, from my perspective, uh, the most important is education because a lot of people don't understand why it's so important. And I think that we must work with people um, 
we must teach them why it's important and how to use it. For example, we make uh, workshops for teachers uh, and we show them how they could use these places because they were there was really big problem for them uh, because they don't understand how to uh, use it, how uh, how to speak with uh, with parents, <laughs> which could be not be very happy that children come back uh, uh, dirty and so on in mud, and and uh, we teach them uh, why it's it's very important about um, uh, the child development and why nature is uh, is important for them. Uh, second thing was uh, uh, constructors. And also, it was a big problem for us to find a person who understands the idea, not only who could build something, but uh, which uh, understand why these things should be nature and also how to build it, uh, that it will be uh, safe and, um, and uh, proper built with a norm of, uh, of safety on playgrounds. And... Um, a lot of people ask me um, how to talk with people who don't want natural playgrounds in their um, kindergartens or their places. And uh, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's first step we should do uh, to to talk with these people. They they should understand why it's important. We couldn't build natural playgrounds in place where teachers and uh, directors don't understand it because it it will don't work. Thank you. Uh, and actually, that brings us very nicely to one of the first questions that came up in the chat was around the the topic of co-production. And um, we I think Isabel was asking if you could elaborate a little bit more on. Um, co-production and how you ensure that co-production is done in a meaningful way so that citizens take ownership and feel like they're part of the project. Um, and I know that Stefan also had a question to, to ask, did you take into account diversity, gender, equity, inclusion aspects in these co-production approaches? And I think that's probably something going back to the two cities. If you could maybe give me a quick answer on that because I have one more question and then I know Roisin wants to throw it back to you guys for the last question. Is that for me, Siobhan? One for uh, Rosie, we'll ask you first. Yeah. I'll also ask the city of Poznan about co-production as well. Yeah, so uh, people can access the information we had. We, we developed a framework for citizen participation, which is available on the Positive City Exchange website. But just to say, we had three strands. We had one which we ran some open calls where we had little pots of money, about 5,000 euro, and we sponsored uh, five or six projects asking you know, people to team up with local designers, with makers, uh, with local businesses to uh, you know, uh, put forward solutions for their environment. And we focused on some of our laneways in the city, which were disused, and we got everything from digital sensor solutions, measuring quality, to a green urban museum where they worked with the local museum and the fab lab to uh, recreate some of the, some of the uh, let's say artworks and, and put them back out into the laneways. Then we had a second, we have a second uh, um, strand which we call City Engage Week. And during those weeks, we have two targeted weeks each year and we run a variety of types of engagements from, um, it's sort of community mapping exercises where community groups go around and geolocate information or opinions about their environment, which then feed into designs uh, to, um, you know, hacker days, uh, do it together projects to um, next generation smart citizen projects. So in order in just on that second question of diversity, we try to offer a bunch of different types of activities at different days and at different times of the day so that we can get a diverse uh, range of people. And then we also try to monitor uh, you know, who is attending those so that we can target specific activities and workshops toward those groups. And then the final thing we're running is a, a positive energy champions campaign. So we will go out for uh, follow um, six people uh, over a period of 20 weeks uh, with the kind of be behavioral change project under different headings to do with energy or to do with um, you know mobility or uh, you know food those kind of things so that's that was our approach to it that's quite a lot there uh, yeah. i like the <laughs> very much um, uh, um, 
um, very well developed approach. Um, I'm just back over to Poznan and I'm particularly this aspect of diversity. Did you kind of proactively incorporate this diversity perspective in your approaches to co-production? Uh, it's a little bit depends if we are talking about the natural playgrounds uh, or open garden, because in fact, natural playgrounds, the stakeholders, uh, the target groups are more or less, we know who will be. So the question was how to involve all the um, participants uh, of the process. So I mean, uh, teachers, uh, managers of the, uh, of the kindergartens, but also children and uh, somehow parents, and maybe from the side of City Hall, uh, the old people uh, somehow are responsible for it, uh, for it to know about it, to also have some uh, way to, to, to act. But uh, when we are talking about the natural, uh, about open garden, then we had to go more actively to the um, bigger part of the stakeholders. So we have to find them. So maybe it was not from the uh, not so much demographic uh, point of view. So rather, so rather how to reach all potential uh, users. Mm -hmm. So we uh, also use the experience of uh, non-governmental organizations that, for example, were responsible for having social gardens to know which type of the people <laughs> could be uh, interesting and uh, to come. So that, that was our um, way of working. Okay, thank you so much. I know we're almost um, short on time and there's some interesting um, sharing going on in chat for anyone else interested in this topic. And we'll definitely pick this up in the takeaway notes, which we'll send out afterwards. But there was a specific question which came in from Marit, which I think uh, comes across a lot. And I, I'm Agnieszka uh, Oshipuk, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. direct this back to you again. <laughs> Who is in charge of maintaining Listen. the playground and yeah. finances this? Yeah. You know, this is always a big question around nature-based solutions. The more, the most important from the beginning, especially, but also later. So uh, our, pro, uh, our concept was to start with the uh, municipal um, kindergartens, just to have the owner of the process. So we as a city hall, as a department of project coordination and urban regeneration, we were responsible for coordination of the process, but for maintaining the uh, playgrounds responsible is uh, manager of the, uh, of the kindergarten of the preschool. So that, that's the model. And uh, again, we are looking for new solutions for open gardens when still the manager is also responsible for such a, part uh, dedicated from the uh, kindergarten garden, but we are looking for more people, more uh, parties engaged in, um, uh, in operating of the space. So thanks Agnieszka. And I know some of those interesting parties that you're talking to are also in the kind of corporate sector and you're, you're exploring this whole area around. Yes. Sponsorship, um, but okay, I, we're, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to hand back to Roshin now. I think Roshin has one more uh, poll, but over to you, Roshin, to say the final words. Uh, yeah. So I'll just share my screen. So we'd like just to thank you all very, very much for contributing on the panel and uh, also in the chat. It was a lively discussion and we will, like Siobhan said, send you five Kiwi messages. And we're going to finish with one more question, but uh, we would just like to run um, also uh, uh, just show you this slide here where if you can are, are an enterprise or uh, a city and you want to join us on the platform where we can, you know, get know you're there as a nature-based supplier or organization looking for nature-based solutions. And so you see that we, you, uh, this one is from Four Reyes in Spain, and uh, their um, landscape architecture, architecture digitalization, and they have three examples of their best practice. And um, the city of Pozan is there as well, and many. I think we have two hundred people, and we very um, would love you to join and display your own best practice, uh, or you can contact me directly. Um, so uh, we'd just like to ask you, I'm going to stop sharing and ask Siobhan to put up the Menti now. 
just before we go, what other topics would you like um, us to discuss? Uh, what other topics within nature-based solutions um, on the Mendy poll? And then just uh, as that poll's going on, maybe we could ask all of our speakers today uh, with your thanks for coming on. If you have any final words of wisdom for other cities and landscape architects and urban planners as they embark on their nature-based solutions. And could we start with um, um, Sarah, Sarah O'Malley? Yep, uh, no problem. Thanks, Roisin. Um, only that it takes time. I think uh, from the bottom up approach takes time, engaging with all of those networks, the wide fishnet that it takes, and particularly with COVID, uh, it, you can't knock on people's doors. It's quite challenging to host uh, interactive uh, post-it note roundtable discussions. So to just be patient and take your time with it. And sometimes a phone call can be the simplest way. And and trust that the person then will ask their neighbor on their behalf to really get a, an idea of what, if you are co-creating that a simple approach like that can, can help, but taking time and just being patient, I think, particularly during the times that we're in. Great. Um, what about Anna? What do you think? What about Ignatia? Okay, so uh, we think that uh, that would be great to always remember about awareness of the subject and just to try to increase uh, the many ways uh, you, you can <laughs> just from both sides or as a municipal or as a um, uh, just uh, or as a business sector from every side. Uh, it's uh, great to all of us and that will bring the benefits. Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, I think from our perspective, trying to, to get as much interdisciplinary working that you can do and across departments, uh, it, that we have the most success with that way of working. And then what I would also say is just really from the bottom up, uh, you know, trying to listen as much to what uh, I suppose communicate clearly what your objective is, but then within that people can also come up with really fantastic ideas that we mightn't have thought of ourselves if we didn't go out to them. Great. Okay, the, the Mendy meter is looking interesting. Um, silo breaking, I see in there, we we know that's true. Um, Siobhan, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that looks like there's plenty of ideas for future webinars. So um, we're a little bit over time. I'd, I'd suggest we wrap it up here. Thank you again to our panel. Um, I think somebody might have, there's a few people got the time wrong who are just joining now, but not to worry. We have recorded this session, so we'll make it available and we'll, we'll send out the key takeaway messages. So thank you very much, Roisin, for um, sharing the session today. Thank you to all of our speakers um, from Poznan, from Limerick, um, and um, we look forward to the next one. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Siobhan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye okay, now, everybody. Bye. 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 Roisin, I, I think there might have been a mix up in the time. I just see some people joining now. Okay. Mm. So it's, it's a, I think we need to put a Irish time or a few different time zones on it. For those just joining now who might have mixed up the time zone, we, we've just finished, but we have recorded the session and we'll send away takeaway messages. So we'll, we'll um, uh, send that link out to everybody afterwards. Thank you very much. We have to end the meeting now. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.